Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Collector Conversations, and thank you for logging on. Every collector has a journey, and every watch collection comes with a story. What strikes me today is that this collection feels like a story I could have told because so many of these watches would have been my personal choice. And frankly, it's almost like I'm looking in a mirror. Lance, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim. A pleasure to be here, and I'm honored to be sitting with you today. Okay, here's one watch that maybe would have been a little bit off my radar. Um, possibly not a watch I would have chosen, and this is where I think we differ, because you're of a little bit of a different generation. How did this first watch happen? Well, this watch happened because uh, my wife was nice to me and presented me with this as a gift uh, back in the early 80s. Um, she knew I liked watches, and up to this point I had had, you know, your typical Timex watches and your Swatch watches, and this... Um, to me and to her was a step up from what I had been wearing. And it is redolent of the 80s. You made me a believer. All right, so now let me ask it. Were you always a watch collector or did you see yourself as more of a one watch guy from the beginning? When I was a teenager, I was always into watches, Timex watches and whatever, you know, inexpensive Japanese watches I could get my hands on. And I was also influenced from a fashion standpoint by my mother. She always used to like to dressed me in nice clothes as a kid and as a young teenager and watches to me were a fashion statement back then um, and at a very young age I always needed to have something on my wrist to, to kind of match what I was wearing that was kind of like the, the initial foray into it for me. It's interesting to me that you were interested <clears throat> in watches from early on because I know when I was a kid it would be things like Armatron and Timex multifunction LCDs, and they weren't great watches, but they were of great interest to me. They, they sort of ignited the passion. After this initial piece, which was a gift, when did you start buying watches for yourself? When did you take that step forward? Probably in my mid-20s, and um, I started to get a little bit more educated. I, was, I would always go to the mall and look at watches and be very interested, and uh, that's where this one comes in the uh, Omega Seamaster. I went into a, uh, a jewelry store in the mall and uh, they were using the marketing of the James Bond marketing at the time so I thought that was pretty cool. That kind of caught my eye. And then looking at the watch itself, I thought it was a beautiful watch. I liked, I loved the, uh, the blue face and uh, it shined. The, the stainless steel sh had a shine to it to me. And I didn't know anything about Omega or, or um, about the, the movements, but that was the James Bond watch, and, and it seemed like a step up from the Gucci that I had had. Well, it's funny because, again, you know, our, our paths sort of cross. This was a watch I saw in the mall back when I was just getting into watches in high school. I couldn't get over that iridescent blue dial. Like, it, I love the fact that it was the Bond watch, and by the way, Bond initially wore the quartz version, so this is right up his alley. Okay. But it's that dial. I mean, did, did you pick the dial? No, it was just there. It was in the case, and um, I just that that spoke to me at the moment. I said, "This is, you know, going to be my my next level uh, of of watch collecting or watch owning." And I thought that was a good choice that I made at the time. Does it still get wrist time? Yes, yeah, all my watches get wrist time. A fun piece. So now you've got the dress watch, you've got the sports watch. When did you start looking at more boutique brands? Because you've got a lot of interesting watches here from what would be described as. Uh, smaller makers? Well, um, the next serious watch I bought, I, I, I don't know if you would consider it a boutique brand, but it's the Cartier. And I went on a vacation in the Bahamas, and I had heard from a lot of people who knew that I liked watches. So if you go to the Bahamas, they got all of these jewelry stores, and you can see a nice selection of pieces. So I kind of went on this vacation figuring I was going to buy something. And I went into the Cartier store uh, in the Bahamas and looked at what they had. And I thought the Roadster was very interesting to me because of the tonneau shape. Uh, one, of my, one of my two collecting um, philosophies is I like to buy watches, one of every brand. As you can see, I don't have any repeat brands here that I brought. And that's my entire collection. There's no duplications. It's one piece of every manufacturer. Another thing I try to do is try when I make a purchase, not purchase something like I already, I already had previously owned, so I may go for a different shape, which is why I went with the Tonneau shape, or um, a color, a color dial. So it was, I wanted to have the Tonneau in my collection. What's interesting <clears throat> to me with the Roadster is that 
In general, Cartier isn't renowned in the mainstream for making men's watches, but in the modern era, they've come on really strong with mechanical watchmaking and men's timepieces and sporting models like this. This is the model I hear most often requested for a revival by men specifically. When men talk about Cartier watches, oftentimes the model they ask to be reintroduced is going to be this one. Are you a car fan by any chance? I like cars, yes. I, I don't know how to work on them, but I know how to drive them. You and me both. <laughs> yes, there's something about the, the automotive leanings of the Roadster that I think endears it to us. I mean, I, I, I got to ask right here, because you don't duplicate watches, have you ever been tempted? Yes, I've, I've been tempted, but then I say to myself, there's a hundred other brands that you'll find something that you like, so why duplicate? You know, why limit yourself? Uh, it's just a weird philosophy that, that I've had, but I have been tempted for sure. So now you do have that philosophy of non-repetition. Is there anything else that drives your view? Is it specifically you fall in love with the dial or you say, now I need a chronograph, you know, checking a column, so to speak? Yeah, like, like I had mentioned with the, um, uh, with the split panda, a chronograph would, would fit into this, you know, this, this purchase category, why I, why I chose this watch, because it's a chronograph. Your Laureato Evo. Right, the Laureato Evo. And I liked the way it looked. Um, it was kind of a combination to me of sporty and dressy. And um, this, when I bought the, the Gerard Perigo, there was not a lot of um, buzz and media hype around Gerard Perigo. It seems after I bought this, which was about six years ago, they became, started to become more pop a more popular brand amongst enthusiasts. So I was very happy that I was kind of at the beginning of that the resurgent phase when I, when I purchased this. So yeah, this scratched the itch of a, a chronograph for me, this, this particular piece. You do have a little bit of two-tone steel gold. Is, is that something that appeals to you or does it strictly appeal on a model by model basis? Model by model, yeah. I, I think it depends on how it looks on that particular watch. It's not, it's not like I really need to have more of those uh, than not, but it, it just depends on the, on the model itself. Now, there is one theme that I notice almost across all your watches, maybe with the exception of the Reverso, but a high degree of contrast, either between the strap and the case or the case and the dial. And that's definitely the case with the Loop in the Third Final Edition. Uh, Manga-inspired. Were you a fan of the manga, or did you just fall in love knew, with the look? knew nothing about it. <laughs> nothing at all. I didn't know who Lupin was. I had no idea. Well, the funny thing is the, the watch itself isn't inspired by Lupin. It's one of his uh, kind of confederates, uh, one of his, his sidekicks. But the watch is absolutely stunning. It's kind of, it's quasi-panda, quasi-inverse panda. Was, was it the dial that caught you? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to have a panda or a panda-related type of, of dial. And when I came across that, I thought that was incredibly unique, having the split look to it. Um, so that, that's what attracted me to it, plus the Zenith movement I've heard and, and read about how, how fantastic the quality of that movement is. So I was getting a combination of a fantastic movement and a really original dial look, and that's what sold me on that piece. <clears throat> was there ever a watch you dreamt of that you actually encountered in person, tried on, and just decided that that was the deal breaker, it wasn't for you? That's a great question. Um, no, I don't think that's ever happened. You know, yeah. you never fell out of love? Okay. Okay, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I'm a hopeless romantic. So let's uh, mix this up a little bit. What is the most recent addition to the collection? That would be the Line A. Very cool. Uh, one that I, I believe you recently reviewed. Yes. Okay. Decided to go small creator, independent brand. Very traditional with the Breguet Arabic numerals. There are a couple of different dial variations. Did you purchase this one new? Uh, no, I got that pre-owned. And so this is the one that spoke to you, salmon dial, granular finish? Salmon dial, that was another check uh, I had to, to, to mark off. Uh, I didn't have a salmon dial watch, so this I was looking specifically for salmon dial watches. And when I came across your review, and uh, I saw this uh, being uh, available, I decided to, uh, to make the purchase, and I'm really happy with it. Really lovely movement, too. Incredible, Be very beautiful movement. You know, it's fun because you can definitely buy more expensive watches, but when you're at a watch event, you pull this out, people know that you're into it. You're, you're beyond the superficial level. This is like a watch nerd watch that'll make you some friends in that company. Have people ever uh, mentioned it to you or commented that it's kind of an unusual? I haven't uh, had it that long or worn it 
uh, enough times, but I'm, I'm sure they will. I mean, it's, it's understated, which is another thing I like about it. It's, it's a classic look, interesting color, but it's, it's kind of understated. It's not, it doesn't, it's not too flashy. You know, sometimes people say that the only rule is that you have to break the rules. And this is definitely sort of the upper limit of flash. So what's <laughs> going on with the Franck Muller co color dreams? How'd this happen for you? Well, um, back about 20 plus years ago, I had a friend who knew I was into watches and he used to tease me a lot and say, when are you gonna buy your Franck Muller? When are you gonna buy your Frank Muller? And I say, ah, I don't really, can't afford it at this time. I'm not at that level yet. And uh, he kept uh, you know, teasing me about it. And one time to kind of get back at him, I purchased a, um, uh, a fake Frank Mueller and I provided it to him as a gift one time. And he actually thought it was, I was giving him a real Frank Mueller. It was, it was, a, it was a good fake. But uh, that was my first knowledge of Frank Mueller was through this friend. And then subsequently, you know, 15 years later, I was able to afford to buy one. And I, and I loved the, I loved the flamboyance of it. It's a very polarizing watch yeah. amongst people. Uh, people have said to me, you know, they're not crazy about it, but, I, I, I like it very much. I think it's a very, very nice piece, and it is colorful. It's well, and that's aptly named. It, it, truth <clears throat> in advertising. Right. But I'd also say it's nice that it's a watch you bought in spite of other people. A lot of times today, especially with social media now, people see things for the first time on an Instagram. They read it hyped up on a forum. Someone will do a YouTube review. And then, you know, someone will decide, oh, I need that watch. But you kind of cut against the grain with that. It's not like your other watches. And... Uh, Maybe people said that wasn't the one to get among the Francs. Was there ever anything else where you just saw the look and you're like, it's offbeat, but I got to go for it, in spite or maybe because of the color? Well, um, I would say that probably the Accutron. Oh, yes. That's kind of uh, offbeat for sure, but it has a very unique history, uh, you know, being an electromagnetic watch. And I think you could correct me if I'm wrong, Tim, but created in the early 60s? Well, yeah, definitely the Accutron Space Hue line was created back then. That I think what makes this one so remarkable is that it's also the first electrostatic motor and generator combo I've ever seen in a watch. And it will wake itself up after it's been asleep for a while. It's got the electrostatic motor for the seconds, stepper motor for the minutes. You've got those two turbines, which are wild. And, you know, I've seen some Accutrons created by Bulova today that really don't deserve the name. There's nothing innovative or aesthetically standout or tangibly, you know, technological about them. They're quartz watches. Whereas with this, this is as much fun for me as my actual Bulova Accutron tuning fork watch. That's a really cool piece. And, I mean, I guess this is the only sort of like dial side movement or open dial watch you've got. Uh, was that what drove you to it? Just the fact that it's got that great history and the, the machine on the dial well, side? That was another reason I bought it because I'm starting to see how popular skeletonized or open work uh, timepieces are. And I didn't have one of those, so that checked off that box for me. So it, it gave me a historical kind of piece in terms of the technology, but also it was uh, an open work and I needed to fit that into my collection as well. And as your skeleton dial watch, you saved a substantial premium on the Royal Oak open work right there. So <laughs> take that double balance. Exactly. Fun piece though. I mean, is there a size limit for your watches? Because this is 43 and a half. Most of your other watches are between maybe 40 and 41. But do you put like a hard limit on the size of a watch based on fit or aesthetics? Yeah, I'm kind of unusual from that standpoint because I don't get too carried away personally with um, size of watches or a watch being too big for me or a watch being too small for me. You know, I, if, if I like to wear it and it's comfortable, I'm not that concerned about size. So I don't particularly make uh, purchases based on, on sizes. It's, it's everything else, maybe, except the size that I'll make the decision on. That, that's an amazing thing because in the watch world, it tends to be very sensual. You know, it's something that's attached to you and it becomes a very physical experience. And a lot of people start with size, but that's not even a consideration for you. No, if, if, if it's comfortable on my wrist, um, I don't really care about whether it may appear too big or appear too small, as long as it's comfortable. I, don't, I wouldn't want to wear anything that's not comfortable. That's fair. Now, you have a very buy-what-you-like approach to these things, and you also buy, let's see right here, we've got German, we've got Swiss, and we've got Japanese. And whereas the Zenith is based on Japanese manga, the Grand Seiko is the real thing. 
A lot of Grand Seiko dials kicking around. Uh, SBGA 269, I think, autumn dial. Correct. How did you find this watch? Uh, well, I found that watch also uh, on YouTube. Uh, another another creator had did a did a um, a presentation on that specific watch, and uh, you know, they had claimed uh, that it's one of the greatest red dial watches you can purchase, and and uh, I agreed. And uh, I really and I wanted to get a Grand Seiko because I've been hearing a lot of good things about them. So that that color really blew me away. And I thought it was an amazing. And in, in different light, it, it really shines differently as well. So were you looking for a red dial watch, or was this more of a, I want to have a Grand Seiko kind of thing? It was uh, check the box, the red, bo the red dial box. Really interesting piece. And I, I, there's just an eclecticism here that's incredible. You've got gold, you've got base metals. You've got colorful dials. You've got you know classic white with the Cartier and the JLC. You've got bracelets. You've got straps. Many different makers, different price points, even different nations. So you really spread the love around. Now I gotta ask you a question about the JLC since we're in that neck of the woods in your watch box. But this is a watch that kinda happened by accident, isn't it? Yeah, I wasn't uh, searching for that specific watch. I was at a local jewelry store and um, I think I had made one purchase previous to being in, in the store that day. So they knew I was, you know, a collector and they pulled that one out and um, I knew something about JLC. I knew about the Reverso and the history of the Reverso. And then they told me this was a GMT. So I said, well, that sounds kind of unusual. So I said, well, you know, I may be interested, but I'm not going to make an impulse buy of, of that amount of dollars. So I went home and did my research and found out to, that this watch is quite rare. So then, then I was interested in the purchase and went back in and um, they gave me a very, very good deal on it. Uh, and I, I really couldn't pass it up because of, of, of this particular watch being so complicated and so unique. And it's really a good thing you did because this full-blown Grand Reverso GMT, it's a watch that even I've only crossed paths with once or twice. Eight-day power reserve, big date, a true GMT function, secondary time zone features, luminescent, like a really, really cool watch. And, you know, just the kind of thing you probably wouldn't even have found in a JLC dealer back in the 2000s and 2010s. So that was perhaps an accidental encounter. No doubt. What is the longest you ever planned to buy a watch before actually buying the watch? That one. Piaget Polo S? Yes. Um, that, that had to check off, I had to check off the green dial box. Yes. And uh, did an extensive amount of research on what's out there in green dials. And that was my favorite green dial uh, that I saw, uh, that any manufacturer was doing at the time. Now there's kind of a, a unique thing about this combination. The, uh, the green leather strap, I bought that separately and put it on this, this particular watch. This watch with the gold tone version was only sold in Japan. So you couldn't get, you couldn't get that on a strap, it would come with a bracelet. And I loved the way the green strap looked compared to the, to the bracelet. So I was able to purchase this from a, a seller in Japan and uh, bought the, um, the strap from Piaget and I think that really makes it pop, the green strap compared to the bracelet. Not that the bracelet isn't nice, but this, this is a rare combination. Not a lot of people would have that combination. Yeah, and I like that you have no real dogmas about what you will or won't do with the watch or how you wear it or even customizing it yourself if it gets you where you want to be. Exactly. It's, it's a fascinating thing because a lot of people often feel compelled to get as close as possible to what they see on social media. Do you... Where do you get your information about watches? Is it social? Is it journals? Well, it's from you. Your primary, one of the primary sources of information. But I watch a lot of YouTube. I subscribe to Watch Time magazine. Um, so uh, I'm constantly, if I'm going out I'm a, and I happen to see a jewelry store that has watches, I'll go in there. It's, it's, it's a total addiction, to, to be very honest. Uh, and I think um, addictions can be good, especially when you educate yourself through that addiction. And that's what, I, what I've done for most of my collecting uh, life. No, it's interesting you say that because I know I'll go to like an airport. I'll be in the airport in Geneva or I'll be in the airport in Hong Kong or Dubai. I'll be like, oh, they have watches here. And, you know, I just find myself going down the rabbit hole and sometimes with no warning. It's that gravitational pull. 
Exactly, and you would have to go down the rabbit hole to find some of these pieces because they're well off the beaten path, particularly here with Ulysse Norden and your dual time. Uh, UN is, in my opinion, one of the great underrated brands, and they're independent again, so their stock's on the rise. How did you discover the brand, and how did you decide this was the right UN for you? Well, I saw this on a, um, a website, uh, a jeweler's website, and I was just blown away by the, the vibrancy of that dial, the color blue dial and the beautiful rose gold. I mean, I believe this is my most beautiful watch that I own. I, I, I just love everything about it. The lugs are interesting, the heaviness to it, the weight when you, when you hold it in your hand. And, and it has some interesting complications that I'll let you speak to because you're better at speaking to complications than I am, but uh, it has interesting complications as well. Well, it's not my story, even though we do see eye to eye. It is your story. So I got to ask, with the Travel Time Watch, have you had a chance to use it? Have you traveled with it at all? Very limited. Uh, I, I do very limited traveling, but I, I may take you up and visit Zurich in, in the very near future. Highly recommended. Visit Watchbox, now 1916 in Zurich. All right. So taking a quick look at your case here, I you do have, you are a bit of a prolific collector. And I have to ask, do you ever sell anything out of this rather sizable collection and portfolio. Is there ever a watch in, watch out type of rule? I don't like to sell. I don't have that itch to sell. Uh, I don't have, fortunately, the necessity to sell at this stage of my life. And I really hope to be able to gift my collection to family members down the road who have all expressed an interest in watches and, 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 and receiving something at that point in time. So um, yeah, I, I not, a, not a seller per se, and I hope to maintain them you know, in the family, that type of thing. So now we've been to Switzerland, we've been to Japan, and now we're gonna take a look at Eastern Germany, state of Saxony, Glasuta. How'd you find your way into this, uh, this 60s single year dial? This is a crazy degradé, a really good look, but explosive, wild. Well, well the 60s is, is a generation that I, I was a little young in the 60s, but I, I, I always kind of dreamed that I was older in the 60s. There's something, I think, very magical that happened in the 60s. So I like the concept of the 60s being represented in this timepiece. And of course, the dial, the, uh, again, checking off a box, an orange. I didn't have an orange dialed watch. And I thought that the sunburst aspect of this was incredible. I liked the simplicity of this watch. Um, I, I could have gotten it with a date, uh, at the six, they, they made it with a date at the six, but I didn't like the way it broke up the dial. And so this was even less expensive than the one with, with the extra complication, and I liked this more. So that was, um, that was something that I wanted to, to, to get based on, on the, um, the concept of the 60s and the incredible incredible dial. Is this the factory strap? Factory strap. That's yeah. a really well-matched strap. It is interesting how we look back on our childhood and kind of our early life and we long for these things that were cool when we were young. Like I remember the 90s being the era of the Dodge Viper and the 993 Porsche Turbo and the Toyota Supra and I'm like dude you were 6 to 16 years old during the 1990s. You didn't drive any of that. Yeah, but you could appreciate them. Exactly and now it's sort of you know I go on bring a trailer and I live out my dreams. And so this is, <laughs> this is your vision of the 60s. Yeah, they, when I life. put that on, I feel like I'm a hippie. <laughs> well, apparently peace and love are forever <laughs> in Eastern Germany. Where do you go from here? What does the collecting path look like or do you not know? Um, I have some ideas, but uh, I think I'm gonna take a break and, and, and try to enjoy and revel in what I have. I, I think as you know, uh, being in this community and having spoken to a lot of collectors, you can get a little carried away at times uh, because you feel like uh, you know you're on a roll, you know uh, that that high. But I think I need to take a step back and uh, enjoy what I have, and then maybe make any additional purchases more uh, on a basis of um, you know what really is important in terms of adding to my collection and maybe getting more into. Um, not so much quantity, but quality in terms of maybe rarity or things of that nature. Now it's interesting to me that you have some watches that you clearly planned out and then watches that just sort of happened, but you're a very disciplined collector and you have very few regrets. A lot of collectors have a lot of regrets and they make mistakes. Do you have advice for people who are getting into the hobby now? Like what might you tell them about how to approach researching and buying a watch? 
I, I think, you know, generally education, you know, uh, because these things can be expensive, not always expensive, but you, know, you want to be ed an educated uh, buyer any time you're making, uh, making a purchase. And um, look, I, I don't want to sound repetitive, but YouTube, which I kind of discovered during COVID, believe it or not, I never watched much YouTube. There's so much information. What I like about the watch world and the watch community is the honesty and the disclosure aspect. All of the information is out there. So it's not really like a minefield, per se, of, of not knowing where to get information. Everybody is pretty much forthright and forward about everything related to watches and collecting, even pricing. It's, it's not a, this mysterious hidden thing. So if you just you know, simply use YouTube, and, and I would definitely recommend uh, subscribing to Watch Time Magazine, uh, that's a lot of information in there uh, as well. And, um, and then have fun with it because that's, it's, it's all about fun and, and the community of the watch collector. Plus, if you get Watch Time Magazine, you know when Watch Time New York is going to be held. Exactly. And yeah, so I think all of these watches, each one has a story and each one has more or less a permanent birth. And I think we all say we want to keep our watches for life, but we rarely do. There's a wonderful permanence about them, even as our tastes are somewhat fleeting. So it's a real refreshing experience to find someone who loves his choices and is committed to them long term. Lance, thank you so much. Thank you for your time, Tim. I had a great time.